Mr. Frank Koch. He is, a, he is the current uh, government security officer, um, belong to the um, Security Bureau, Hong Kong Special Administrative Region uh, government. Uh, Frank himself is a, is a policeman, is a senior police officer, but he's now sequined by, from police to the, um, to the uh, Security Bureau, looking after all the emergency planning, uh, coordination and contingent planning, as well as security for the uh, Hong Kong SAR government. Um, Frank is going to um, cover the emergency planning and con condition planning and coordination about the Hong Kong SAR government. So um, it would be nice to uh, follow what Rick has said from the Australian experience and now come down to the Hong Kong experience. All right. And Frank, when you're ready. How do you start it? Uh Okay, let's uh, welcome Frank. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Can you hear me clearly? Hello? Yeah, thank you, Jimmy. Uh, actually, Jimmy is, used to be a police officer. He's now retired. Uh, we used to work very closely together. Uh, things he did, we can't tell you. But I can tell you, this job was a really interesting one. Uh, we, we all save lives, all right? In my line of work, we kill terrorists to save lives. In his line of work, the first person he saves is himself. He's a bomb disposal officer. Very good incentive to start his day of work every day, saving yourself once again. Now, Jimmy made a small error about uh, the topic I'm going to talk to you about. Today I'm going to talk about disaster exercise planning uh, in Hong Kong. Okay. Actually, having listened to uh, Rick's uh, presentation, I actually wanted to change it to disaster exercise training or uh, uh, disaster training in Hong Kong and Australia. Oh, I, I want to go to talk about Australia because I, I had some uh, experience uh, of Australia's uh, advanced uh, techniques as well. Well, see, uh, see if I can. I have the time. Okay, my job. In my job, I oversee government's uh, emergency response management system, and one of the subject areas that I take care of is exercise uh, planning. When I receive the request to speak on this subject. How do you work with this? I wonder where to start to talk about this, because there is so much going on in the area across the government in this area. How do I give it a fair treatment without omitting something important or uh, someone worth mentioning? In the end, I decided I would give an overview of the government's emergency response framework. This forms the basis for many of our disaster preparedness activities. I'll then give you a few snapshots of disaster exercise and planning activities undertaken by various government departments. And hopefully these would tell you uh, the kind of government efforts we uh, uh, undertake and the approach we use. Then I propose to take a look at another part of the equation in the disaster preparedness uh, question, the community aspect. Okay, now it doesn't work. Ah. All right, images of disasters in Hong Kong. I don't know how many doctors there are now in this auditorium, but I'm sure some of them, some of you, might have personal experience of dealing with these disasters in Hong Kong. It is the government's policy to provide an effective and efficient response to all emergency situations which threaten life, property, and public security. 
Our priorities obviously start with saving lives and property. But meeting basic needs of those affected in the immediate aftermath of a disaster is equally important, alongside other efforts to restore the community to normality. In fact, I think criticism on disaster response in modern societies these days often center around provision of basic needs rather than saving life. To do, to do that job well, we need a lot of people in the government working together. Underpinning the government's disaster response efforts is the emergency response system, the ERS. We adopt a bottom-up approach in the framework, which means frontline departments have full authority to initiate measures in response to any emergency, as they would manage their day-to-day -day operations. They can cross-talk, they can collaborate with other departments through standing or ad hoc emergency coordination centers. This ensures a speedy initial response to any event. They will work according to appropriate contingency plans. Such as these, dealing with air crash, natural disasters, maritime search and rescues, etc. If there is potential for the emergency to be increased in scale or impact, a senior officer at the government secretariat level will be called out to monitor the, uh, the event itself. If an event has widespread and significant implications, senior officials of the government will be involved all the way up to the CE, the chief executive. And that will constitute a tier three response. In the top tier response, the Emergency Monitoring and Support Center, the EMSC, will be activated. In fact, the Secretary for Security can activate that center at any stage of our framework to start monitoring an event. As the name suggests, this is not a command center. The center is linked into all information feeds available to the government, for example, other departmental emergency coordination centers. Through the EMSC, senior government decision makers can have a bird's eye view of the ongoing situation. While frontline departments are busy dealing with operations under their respective purviews, senior officials here can better appreciate how individual operations or measures are actually connected to each other and ensure they work coherently to support the overall effort. They can be more forward-looking and devise strategic directions in an informed manner. That's their job. This is just a list of some, some of the ECCs that I've mentioned. One that deals with transport, another one deals with airport emergency, maritime rescue. There are many, many other uh, ECCs in the government. Now, let's look at a few snapshots of government's efforts in disaster exercise and planning. This is called OILEX 2015. Earlier this month, the Marine Department organized an oil spillage field deployment exercise. The scenario involved a tanker colliding with the container feeder vessel, causing significant oil and hazardous material spillage. A total of eight departments and five private sector organizations took part in it. The exercise tested physical deployment of pollution combating equipment at sea. 
on-scene co coordination amongst departments and, and the oil companies. As you can imagine, a spillage at sea could quickly spread. So a well-oiled response to contain the spillage could very well change the nature of the incident. From a full-blown environmental disaster to a localized incident that can be managed without much difficulty. February 2015, exercise Pacific Wave 15, what we call Pack Wave 15. Running over a period of five days from the 2nd to the 6th of February, Pack Wave 15 was organized by UNESCO for testing the new operational Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, and more specifically, a new product, the Pacific Tsunami Warning and Mitigation System. The exercise simulated Pacific countries receiving tsunami threat warning messages containing wave amplitude forecasts produced by this uh, system. And then member states would then use the information in their decision making for their response. The exercise included multiple scenarios and was conducted in real time. A total of 42 Pacific countries and locations participated in the exercise. Hong Kong joined the exercise on the 5th of February and responded to a simulated earthquake and tsunami in the Manila, Manila Trench. In Hong Kong, we also used the opportunity to organize a tabletop exercise to test our department's coordination and response capabilities to deal with things like floods and displacement of aircraft uh, resulting from the tsunami. A total of 24 bureaus and departments participated. Cruise ship emergency workshop, January last year. When the Kai Tak cruise terminal was commissioned, we anticipated that cruise ship traffic in Hong Kong waters would increase. The workshop was designed to test departments' readiness in responding to various kinds of emergency that could result. A total of 19 departments or agencies took part. And they went, and they went to three lectures and two table, tabletop exercises uh, in one day. Exercise checkerboard is a territory-wide exercise to test the Dire Bay Contingency Plan. Following the Fukushima accident in 2011, our government conducted a comprehensive review of the Dire Bay Contingency Plan, which is Hong Kong's nuclear emergency contingency plan. And then we followed it up with a large-scale government-wide exercise to test its soundness. It was held in April 2012, the exercise involved 1,000, over 1,000 public officers, including the CE himself, the Chief Secretary for Administration and the Financial Secretary, as well as over 2,000 members of the public. The scenario used was based upon the Fukushima accident, that is an off-site radiological event caused by earthquake and tsunami. And using that opportunity, we basically tested all the most important elements in the plan, like radiation monitoring of air, food, drinking water, and even seawater, evacuation sheltering in uh, Pingzhou, where um, we believe the plume from any radiological release would affect most. Apart from large-scale, government-wide exercises held at longer intervals, individual departments also carry out more routine exercises. For example, the Water Services Department has chlorine leakage drills held every month at all of its 21 chlorination plants across the territory.
chlorine, a toxic and highly irritating gas, even in minute quantities, is heavier than air, and so would, link, would sink to the ground and linger in areas where they could affect many people who are unaware. So a lot of special care needs to be taken. Every year, the Fire Services Department will also exercise with the plants to simulate a more extensive leakage uh, event involving chlorine. Another example of the more routine, communication test at the EMSC, which is managed by my office. So I've got to mention it here. The exercise tests the proper functioning of all communication systems, including fallback system. A total of 36 bureaus and departments would take part in the exercise every month on the first Friday. Special risks exercises by the fire services department. Now every quarter, fire stations located in different districts with special risks, like dangerous goods warehouses, special treatment plants, oil depots, things like that, will hold exercises targeting those risks. These drills are conducted with the full participation of the management of the relevant facilities. Now I've come to a unit that I must mention in uh, talk when I'm talking about disaster preparedness the Disaster Victim Identification Unit of the Hong Kong Police, or the DVIU. This is a unit on standby 24-7, ready to respond to any incident involving mass fatalities. It is made up of fresh graduates of the Police Detective Training Program of the Hong Kong Police. As part of the program, they train in practical exercises simulating deployment at a disaster scene. At any one time, there are around 300 officers ready for deployment. And there are two last for six months. The work is a very crucial element of the response in major disasters involving mass fatalities. Where much of the recovery operation the subsequent investigation and even judicial process would hinge upon the quality of the work. They are responsible for recovery of bodies, remains, and property for identification later. They must be able to meticulously document their finds. To do that, they need to preserve the scene, often under chaotic circumstances, and then go about organizing their work methodically. And they are always under time pressure. Obviously, undue delays when there are dead bodies and concerned relatives involved are not desirable. Training is provided every three months to a new class of detectives. This way, the police ensures a constant supply of officers with up-to-date knowledge and skills to perform this important task. And the police do not simply drill them in the same old techniques over and over again every three months. They constantly look for ways to enhance their capability. Last year, the DVIU collaborated with the Innovation and Technology Commission and developed a disaster recovery system using tablet computers. Now, let me explain in more detail some of the operational challenges so that you, you understand what kind of innovation they are talking about. Imagine you are a DVIU member now, and you're deployed to a field with many bodies and their personal effects strewn around. For you to clearly document where you find what, and the state you find them in, etc., you need to record the information on a form. And that form, needs to be somehow paired up with the object you find for subsequent tracking and identification. So the form needs to be uniquely numbered or marked. Now you could be just 
one of 150 officers doing the same thing in an air crash site. Working against time and the weather on tough terrains. And you ask yourself, do you make up your own numbering system for, the, for your forms? And every one of the 150 officers do the same thing. Now, traditionally, you will be given forms with pre-printed unique numbers. But then the team leader, somebody like Rick, would have a hard time tracking which series of forms have gone to which member responsible for which sector. And the forms attached to the bodies in a temporary mortuary do not necessarily follow a particular order. And then there are forms that are unused, or otherwise ruined, or lost in the chaos. Is it confusing enough for you already? Good. That's the idea. With the tablet computer project, they employ existing RFID technology in delineating a site into a grid. Now, armed with the tablets, not paper forms, connected wireless to a mobile server, the DVIU members can now tag objects, bodies, with RFID tags, photograph them, draw sketches, write descriptions, etc., with one tablet. And the records will be automatically time-stamped, given a coordinate on the grid, and given a unique serial number for the whole team, for the whole site, one series. At any one moment, the team leader can find out his team's progress exactly. And the team's work overall is many times faster and more accurate. Now, I wanted to talk about risk reduction, which is very high on the government's agenda as well. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to cover these here. But hopefully, having seen the snapshots that I just showed you, you would appreciate that at any level of the government, at the secretariat level, departmental, and even unit level, there are many activities ongoing throughout the year in pursuit of disaster preparedness. Now, I would, I would like to direct your attention to another part of the equation, as I mentioned earlier, in disaster preparedness, the community. And to think about one particular aspect within this part that I think is sometimes omitted in our work focus. Let's look at two well-known disasters. First, Hurricane Katrina. Prior to Hurricane Katrina, I normally associated New Orleans with the Mardi Gras. Now I think of images of submerged buses and the Superdome. Just some quick facts to remind you of um, what happened during Hurricane Katrina. Basically, what I want you to look at is a combination of many unfortunate events and failures at different levels of government, causing the plan of buzzing over 20,000 people stranded at the Superdome to fall apart. What happened was the government announced a plan to bust those without means to evacuate by themselves out of the city before the storm. Traffic gridlock forced the plan to be changed to one of seeking shelter at the Superdome. And then the federal levees broke. The city was flooded. Many houses and buses submerged. By the time more buses were made available for evacuation from outside the city, the security situation inside the city had deteriorated so much that no drivers were willing to drive into the city. So the people ended up stranded in the city for days. Many died because of heat exhaustion 
and dehydration because there was no drinking water, no electricity. It was hell on earth. When the authority makes a promise of a disaster relief and then doesn't deliver, things can go very wrong. Because to many, like those stuck in New Orleans, that promise is all they could count on. Or more pertinently, that is all they would ever think of counting on. These two quotes were from a video on the um, evacuation program for New Orleans, released not after the uh, disaster, but before the uh, disaster in that summer, urging those without means of transportation to take responsibility for their own safety. Obviously, most did not heed the, that advice. As emergency planners, we often remind ourselves of the danger of complacency, of our own plans. But in this case, is there also some element of complacency on the part of the community? Are people in authority somehow breeding this complacency? Hold that question in your mind while we look at the second disaster. When the mega earthquake hit Japan, over 100 students and teachers of the Okawa Elementary School near Fukushima followed well-practiced protocol and evacuated the school buildings to the safety of the school ground immediately. There, 26 of them were picked up by parents who arrived very quickly in their private cars, and they drove them away. The rest of them, more than 80 odd teachers and students, waited on the playground while two senior teachers argued about the next step of the evacuation. They argued for 55 minutes. Well, not all of them waited. There was one teacher and seven students who ignored the argument from the outset and evacuated themselves up the hill behind the school right away. They survived. The others, they were washed away, and 75 students and teachers were killed. In stark contrast, the students of another junior high school on another uh, part of the coast took safety in their own hands. The earthquake knocked out the school's power system, so there were no PA announcements to follow. Without hesitation, the students began evacuating themselves to higher ground, even before the teachers had time to step in and direct the exodus. The students fled in the lead, the teachers caught up and followed them. And 350 students from a neighboring elementary school also followed them. They all made, made it to safety. All of them survived. Clearly, common sense and basic survival instinct made the difference in the Japan example. Rather than dogmatic adherence to official protocol. An expert on evacuation at the University of New Orleans said, all the planning in the world will not be successful if people aren't ready to evacuate. He said this with the benefit of the painful experiences of Hurricane Katrina, as well as that of successful evacuation of over 18,000 residents in another hurricane hitting the city in 2008, Hurricane uh, Gustav. But today he still worries about the complacency of the community. In conclusion, I would say, our efforts to promote disaster preparedness must also instill a healthy degree of self-reliance in the community and recognize the fact that people in authority and professionals do not always have the solution. We do not always get it right, and we are not always in control. Now, what about Hong Kong community? I'll leave that for you to ponder how much we have got ahead of us on this topic. Thank you. Thank you.